follow the sun. Hello, welcome to Paramusic Mysteries. I'm Johnny Long. Now we're going to have part two of the Oklahoma Girl Scout murders. I hope you watched the first video. Um, if you haven't, I will give you a bit of a recap before going into the uh, second part of this story. between June 12th and 13th, three little girls attending Camp Scott in Locust Grove, Oklahoma, would be found murdered June 13th at 6 a.m. by camp counselor Carla Wilhite. Now, unfortunately, before the arrival of authorities, the crime scene had been tampered with, unintentionally, of course, during the discoveries of the bodies, there would be first the discovery of Doris Denise Milner, age 10, by Carla Wilhite. Then as the other counselors came to the scene, the bodies of Lori Lee Farmer and Michelle Gousset would also be found. But they would not be found in the same condition as Doris Denise Milner, the only one that had clearly been raped and strangled. Lori Lee Farmer and Michelle Gousset, although it is believed that they were molested in some way, possibly raped, both of them were beaten but not strangled and were probably dead quite a while before Doris Denise Milner. State Trooper Harold Berry would arrive on the scene and as soon as he was aware that he was dealing with a triple homicide, he immediately stopped anyone from contaminating the scene any further and secured the immediate area as best he could while busloads of children were being evacuated off of the Camp Scott property. Now after interviewing all the witnesses, a list was made of known sex offenders in the area of Locust Grove and one name became most prominent and that was G. Leroy Hart. He was a convicted rapist who had escaped from the Mays County Jail about four years previous. There were other names that were looked at, but Hart's crime seemed very reflective of many of the things that happened at Camp Scott. Schroff lived just about a mile from the camp. After learning probably most of the local police force was at Camp Scott, he went there personally with his son, informing the police that items had been stolen from his home. This was probably a mistake on Schroff's part, being that law enforcement had at that point learned that it was very common for the perpetrator to return to the scene of a crime items that he reported stolen were found at Camp Scott, including black duct tape and nylon rope. Now Schroff would be interrogated and finally submitted to a polygraph test which he passed. Between his alibi and passing the polygraph test, Schroff was cleared of any wrongdoing. Unfortunately, for a few days after word leaked that Schroff was being interrogated, rumors began to circulate that the perpetrator had been found. The OSBI and the Sheriff's Department had to publicly exonerate Jack Schroff. The 
term high strangeness, which basically describes an atmosphere of paranormal activity surrounding a story which may or may not be paranormal in nature itself, but there are elements that surround it which is almost like being in the twilight zone, I guess you could say. But there's also a human element to this story which uh, I will briefly touch upon and give you a sense of who was involved and how certain attitudes came into play. So, let us look at the key players in the search for Gene Leroy Hart. Mays County Sheriff Glenn Weaver was perhaps the strongest advocate for Hart being the prime suspect in the murders at Camp Scott. He was first elected sheriff in 1969 and would serve until 1981. It was during his term that Hart would escape from Mays County Jail, leading many to believe that Weaver's desire to capture Hart was a personal vendetta. This seems ludicrous now, being no matter your opinion of Hart's guilt or innocence in the crimes of Camp Scott, Hart was still a convicted rapist, a crime for which he pled guilty, a burglar, a crime in which he was caught red-handed, and although it is not on the list of charges levied against him, also an attempted murderer. For it's pretty clear that he intended for the two pregnant women that he brutally beat and raped in the middle of the woods in Mays County to die. Special Agent Harvey Pratt of the OSBI would also be assigned to the case due to his knowledge of Native American culture. Pratt, of course, was Native American himself, being of Cheyenne Arapaho heritage. Now, much of Pratt's experience with the case can be further examined by watching the documentary Someone Cry for the Children, where he talks extensively about his use of Native American traditions in looking for heart. And speaking of the book, Someone Cry for the Children, I do highly recommend that you read the book or watch the documentary, co-authored by Mike and Dick Wilkerson, who are also OSBI agents involved in the search for heart. And there is also Crying Wolf, an authentic Native American medicine man who was also recruited by the OSBI. It is said that he agreed to do so only under the agreement that the magic that he used would be used to find Hart, to bring him to justice, not to determine his guilt or innocence. And on the other side of this fence is Sam Pigeon, with whom Hart would eventually be found when he was captured. It is also rumored Pigeon was teaching Hart ways of medicine. It would also be announced that two tracking dogs were being brought in. The press started calling them the Wonder Dogs. But from this moment on, this is where the high strangeness really begins. things that were found during this time were several pairs of women's prescription glasses. Three piles were found with two or three glasses in each. Word had reached officers on the field that a curse had been placed on the dogs by a powerful Cherokee medicine man and that both of them would die soon. 
One thing that fascinates me the most about this is the fact that these stories do not just come from urban legends that have come out over the years. These are stories that come from people in the OSBI. And there's never been, as far as I can tell, any denials that these stories happened. The dogs began to display some odd behavior. For one, in an open field they were tracking something, but the trail would end abruptly and the dogs would jump around and bark as if whatever they were tracking had suddenly taken flight. Now the only way to explain this behavior would be if they were tracking a bird on the ground and the bird decided to fly away. But of course the scent that these dogs were given was not a bird. It is also stated that there were no trees surrounding the area in question. But what would happen to these dogs next truly defies the imagination. On the 18th of June, one would die of heat exhaustion. And the following day, the other one would run into traffic and be hit by a car. And now we come to one of the more interesting characters, District Attorney Sid Wise. Now Wise would announce at this point in a press conference that there were no suspects. But Sheriff Weaver would announce that there was one suspect. And the OSBI would announce that there were three suspects. But I think as far as the Mays County Sheriff's Department is concerned, Jean Leroy Hart was their number one suspect. And the OSBI also considered the homeless man named Mike and one who is only referred to as the Indian or Native American hitchhiker. Sheriff Weaver would also announce that a murder weapon had been found. District Attorney Sid Wise would contradict this, saying basically that Weaver was mistaken. However, on the very next day, Sid Wise was forced to make a complete turnaround by announcing that there were several suspects and there was a mountain of evidence. Now is a good time to go into a lot of the evidence found within these last few days, starting from the day of the murders to the point where we are now, which is June 22nd. Three piles of eyeglasses that were found, bloody shoe prints in tent number eight, which were airlifted to a crime lab. The flashlight modified by plastic being put over the lens and a small hole cut in the center to help reduce the glare that comes from the flashlight, most likely to keep whoever was using it from being seen as well at night. Now the flashlight also had newspaper stuffed inside next to the battery probably to keep it in place because as I remember these big flashlights seem to have a problem with when the battery would shift around inside it would flicker off and on. It seems that this was a way of stopping that. What was purported to be the murder weapon was said to have had several fingerprints on it which at this point were also being tested along with some other possible prints Oh. 
cave was found about two miles north of Camp Scott. It even has this note scrawled on the wall. Of course, a closer look reveals that the date on the top, the numbers are reversed. The year's listed first, then the month, and then the date, whereas normally we list the month, the date, and then the year. But this style of recording a date is prevalent in both the military and in prison. But the most solid link to heart were the two pictures that were found of three women. Turns out the pictures were developed actually by Jean Leroy Hart when he was working at Granite Reformatory apparently developing pictures. Although this is a very solid lead in the end it would still be brought to question. On the 30th of June, Hart's mother, Ella Mae Buckskin, tells the press that she's being harassed by law enforcement. She also accuses Sheriff Weaver of planting the photographs found in the cave. But Weaver has to have a suspect, so he blames her son. These accusations turn out to be far more important in the story.